Well, you've got pretty much every tagline known to man. Okay. <laughs> known to man. You've got, I think I went, on, went on your LinkedIn um, six times, Young Entrepreneur of the Year. UK's most innovative inventor. <laughs> now in property. <clears throat> Serial entrepreneur on pretty much every level possible. <laughs> um, mad exciting stuff in the future, man. So it's fucked, mate. It's actually mental what you're doing, man. That's cool. Um, That's good fun. But to run it all back then, Flux was obviously where things started for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I was just, I was making sure because I did see a couple of other things that I was looking at, but how did Flux actually start? And like, was that something that you were always obsessed with, like engineering and creating products? Um, or is that something that evolved with, I imagine, how businesses evolve for you as well? Yeah, exactly. So Flux started out of, much like you with the gaming, mm -hmm. I was like a professional kind of bagpiper. Yeah. Uh, I've been playing since I was nine um, and then took that on. Then I started to get a bit of passion for engineering. Yeah. Um, and eventually when I was through school, I applied for competitions and things and scholarships and all this and got a lot of recognition for that. So I had a kind of newfound talent in engineering and I had my passion for playing the bagpipes. And it got to a point where I combined that and made a product. So basically to give a rundown of the product, mm -hmm. um, there's a problem with moisture in the bagpipes. So condensation from your lungs enters the bagpipes. It lies on the surfaces of the instrument. It can crack the instrument, changes the sound, all these things. And it's really un uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. It's out with your control. So basically there was a few other products in the market that tried to capture the moisture from your breath. But what I'd done is went and re-engineered re the full system. All, okay. all the products that were on the market already, I doubled up, I tripled up on them and they didn't work. So I went and used the kind of skills in engineering, looked at what had to be done, done a lot of research and then it took me four years kind of developing that throughout school. Mm. Um, then how Flux kind of started. I actually hate the name, by the way. I don't know, but uh, you probably love the name of your business. I hate mine because it's I picked it when I was so young mm. and then you hear it all the time and it just becomes old, man. Yeah. I don't know about you, but um, anyway, so that's it's actually the Latin word for airflow, right? Okay. So I thought I was being smart with that, which is totally fine. So <laughs> anyway, we're there. We're there. We have to stick with it now. So um, made this product mm. when I was 14, developed it. It cools and condenses the moisture from your breath. It's like blown on a cold window. And then through a difference in pressure, it absorbs it out the main airway. And, um, sorry, removes it out the main airway. Uh, and then it's absorbed by a special cloth. And the cloth's really, really, really fucking cool, man. It's something that absorbs like four times more moisture than any other like sponge mm. or special bead that other kind of products use. And it can be reused like over 300 times. So it, it's absolutely class, man. So that's made a real mark. And that's where Flux really started. So that's the kind of product side. Mm -hmm. That's mental, man. And in terms of Flux, mate, I used to play with a guy in COD. His name was Flux. <laughs> so that was his alias, mate. Was so it X, always... X Flux Cyan? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was Flux and it changed to Fluxery um, was his name. But I, it was, in terms of my name, we were actually rebranding the name of, of YEN, mate, because I felt like it was... I was so close to doing that with my own uh, thing, man. I and just then, feel like it's too corporate, mate. See, the thing is, right, I had the World Pipe Band Championships at the weekend mm. and I had a stall and I was running it. And although I hated the name Flux, folk come up and they're like, fucking hell, it's the Flux. It's it's Flux, you know what I mean? And they've seen it for ages and that yep. was my first physical event. So I reckon you'll find one day that it'll, like, folk will be like, oh shit, that's why you're in, that's why you're in. It'll, yeah. it'll come to that. So, But maybe it's a good time for you to do that. Maybe it's no, who knows? For sure. I think it's the what we're aiming for in terms of the people that we're targeting uh the market we're moving into the target audience is definitely far different from young entrepreneurs network is very corporate kind of yeah, yeah what it says in the tin yeah um not not super intriguing it's like if you're not a young entrepreneur it's like turn aye, off. It's um, set back, yeah. yeah so i we're gonna be rebranding it mate and we're gonna be i don't know when this episode will be going live to be fair i might just drop it anyways but we're gonna be merging with young and lazy Right, I young and lazy's name, class. I'm using that as a face of the company. So that literally represents that no bullshit approach to entrepreneurship, mate. Yeah. And even at times when I feel like I was taming myself on LinkedIn and stuff because of, and people associate network with networking mm -hmm. and BNI, you know, like all the yeah, kind of stuff they associate with when it's stuff, yeah. nothing like what I do or what you do, SXR, for example. It's nothing like that. And yeah, young and lazy is way more bold, way more represent. I think it represents me as an individual and everyone else within the network so. exactly i feel like the new form of networking for us it's like 
it's working together yeah, yeah isn't it it's actually doing something together um as opposed to going to a coffee morning or something uh, so yeah. i've never been to one of them it's one of those things mate it's like a value driven thing like i used to wonder like my mum for example she used to obviously be coached by um paula and that would she would go to four things a week for that mate right and then with networking events i can bring myself to go to one one a week Aye. and then when i was running them it was like bringing in footballers bringing in incredible people cool to try folk. and make it more more interesting yeah. but the churn of clients at lifetime value was still small because it was still the same concept of turning up getting to know everyone yep. what happens when you get to know everyone you know, you just you can get one to ones out with it. Everyone and build relationships. You need to do business with folk. Yeah, that's the thing. Like when I'm, we'll get on to this. Obviously, I'm getting involved in property just now, and yeah. and like a lot of folk come into property and I just want to have a coffee with everyone. It's like, why the fuck do you want to have a coffee with me? Like, what can we can we make money together? Mm. You know what I mean? Can we do business? If yeah. not, like, I'm I'm not interested to be honest. I didn't just want to chat for a bit. I want to mm. do something, and um, there, there's a lot of shit out there. And, it, and it's fine, obviously, folk want to get connected, that's completely fine, but I've realised I don't reach out to folk anymore unless I can either provide them value. Yeah. And that's the same with what we're trying to do with why, what you're trying to do with YEN. Yeah. You know, we're in similar mindsets for that, and I totally get it. 100%, mate. Because it's like putting a value focus as opposed to maybe something could come from it or maybe something could evolve, and that's uh -huh. probably why, like, I went the cool video message route, for example, yeah. because I wanted very quickly for someone to pick up whether or not we were like-minded. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing, me and you. Like, ah, exactly. That, that yeah. video would have hit and it would have made you think, fucking hell, I could probably, could probably work with this guy. I could probably get along with this guy. I like it. Whereas people just go down a route of like, what's happening, Robbie, mate? How you doing? How you Love doing? your content. Let's go out and grab a whatever. And it's like, what is the, you know, how do we, how do we move forward from yeah. this? Um, and I know people just, people want to naturally build rapport. And I think relationships uh, Naval speaks about it all the time relationships compounding over time mm -hmm. the more you get to know someone and the more your relationship grows the more opportunities are presented yeah and i wanted to build an environment probably similar to what you were thinking too i want to build an environment where people's relationships compound but in the same time they get immense value yeah and it's like people can't lose when they're in an environment totally man totally. so in terms of sxr then the thought process with that with suhit what was like because I know we've kind of briefly spoke about it when we, we went and grabbed some scran, but the kind of thought process being you were a student entrepreneur at, for, for a lot of the time that you were in entrepreneurship and you yeah. wanted to provide support for individuals that were super young. I mean, some of the people, what some of the ages of people within SXR? Yeah, SXR. So basically, I'll tell you what SXR is first. Yeah, go for it. So, or the reason we started it. So, me and Sue hit. Me and you, John, went into business completely differently, right? I got connected to Scottish Enterprise and then got connected to like RBS, then it was Strathclyde and I've been through all these accelerators and everything, which is brilliant. It's been really good for me. It's got me connected to the right people. Um, but for pushing kind of newer things, like what you're doing and all these products that your clients are doing, it'll work a lot better for them. But for me, I went the, the traditional route as such, mm. you know? And I got so much value at that and I, and I still get a lot of value at it. I've got office space at Strathclyde and things I use now, and that's that's absolutely brilliant. So Suhit went the same route. He'd done a few other things, but we both shared an office at some point in RBS. Uh, went through that accelerator for, was it 18 months, I think we went went through that. And we had good connections to, like, the easy money that can, that can be actually accessed yeah. if you have the good idea uh, and the right people. So it gave us a lot of value or experience. So we thought, we want to share this because... Literally, it is just, it's so, it's so easy that you just actually need to send an email, have a chat with someone, uh, find out if your idea can be supported in any way and you get money. So, And it's good if you're young. We found that all these accelerators and, and things in Scotland, support in Scotland that's available, which is brilliant. Um, they really want to push young innovation and, and young businesses and all these kind of things. So basically, me and Suhit were our pals through RBS mm -hmm. uh, and we just got chatting and we we're like, let's try and provide some value not just off of these connections that we've got in both our industries, product and service based, but the fact that we started our businesses when we were young is like 14, 15, um, and that we're running businesses in university and that we're using everything our, to our advantage when we're young. So we thought, let, let's push this and let, let's kind of start a group that's going to help people. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it started in January. I think we launched, launched yeah. the kind of first cohort this year. And it's grown and actually in the past month it's starting to grow like this which is really really good but it is just 
a lot of value for young people trying to get involved in business and like if they've got an idea if they're trying to push their business um and it's been it's been really really great for that 100 percent, mate. and i think also uh, being involved with sxr too i think it's something that people from the outside will think an element of competition whereas we both see it as an element of collaboration exactly. helping each other move forward and they're far different just like we said before we came on me and you are different individuals who so attract different kinds of people yeah. um even though we're like-minded it's something that just like you said the roots that we went down will shape it's like i think some people don't realize people like gary v grant cardone fucking even andrew tate they're all shaped by like their own version of their own reality exactly. that brought them up yeah so what like you want to pass on to students or individuals that are entrepreneurs uh, at a young age will be different from what we pass on or different yeah. from what the groups are focused on or whatever it may be and that's what's super fucking powerful mate because you're yeah. in a position where see i come across a student entrepreneur that's maybe just not ready for where yen could potentially take them yeah why would i not pass them to you to see if that yeah. would potentially help you move forward so exactly it's it's all about it's all about that connection man it's yeah. all about making connections helping each other out that's how relationships are built um and it's it's getting to the point where it's been what like eight months now and me and so have been running this and we obviously yeah. have our weekly calls and all this and we're getting the cool guests in and all these millionaires and all this stuff right and that's brilliant but it's actually like lifestyle coaching yeah. we've got a young guy who's 15 when he joined i think he's just turned 16 and he's making that what is it, like three three four grand a month he's trying to scale that to 10 a month and that's just in the last eight months we've got him like inspired to go to the gym a couple of lads like three of the lads in the group are going to the gym together three times a week and that and he sent a message in the day and said going to the gym is like the best thing i've ever done <laughs> for my confidence and like my well-being and that helps in my business and i can see that and it's like actually fulfilling and it's getting to that stage for us where it's like right we've we've helped this person now and our job is to make ourselves redundant yeah. we don't want folk to stay forever because in the business model it doesn't really work does it you want folk to join take what they need get inspired blah 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 and leave and go on and do massive stuff and and yeah. that's kind of that's what we are all about you know yeah 100 percent, man it's something that is yeah it's the like, we, like you said earlier on the kind of newer scope of networking the newer scope yeah. of providing value but not in a way that is based on how many clients can i pass you and what can i you know what kind of money pack can i put in the table for you it's something yeah. more more fulfilling things like the gym man and things like we had um Corn Malone, he does a high performance day once a week. That's he's up at four and he's at a run at half four. And he records the run and he records what he's thinking about and how it's going to shape his day. And then the whole point of that is that he's ahead of his day by an extra two hours before he's in the gym as a personal trainer and doing everything that he's doing. Right. And mate, every single day he sticks that video in. It's does, like Does he do that high performance day once a week? Did you once say? Once a week, yeah. Mate, I'm taking a note of that. I absolutely love that. Because the whole point of him, like, because he's he's got just always have box of knowledge mate but he doesn't necessarily want to do it every single day um yeah so the once a week mate it just allows for him to just challenge himself on every level possible That's class. um and being up at four mate and it's like even that like it's like talking while you're running mate and i'm like mate if i tried to talk while i was running man i'd probably pass the fuck out <laughs> so i can start coughing or something <laughs> um but the inspiration mate is like so contagious man you wake up mate like i wake up at six every morning and see when I wake up on his high performance day and he's put that video on the chat, I'm like, yeah, I am ready to lock it the fuck That's in. The, you know that boy, uh, he was on The Apprentice, Thomas Skinner. I think I've seen him, you know. You know, yeah. he sells the mattresses, Bosch beds, right? Every day, or I think the majority of days now, he used to do it a lot more, I think. He'd get up, it's like, it's like half four, five, and he's in the warehouse and he's like, right, I'm selling mattresses a day, we deliver, <laughs> we're up, we're driving up to Scotland, we're doing this. And he's like, have a class day. And I'm like, That's unreal. Absolutely. you wake up and see that and you're like fuck i'm, a, I'm up at half five why, why am i not up at half four you know oh, it's, <laughs> it's unreal man game, it's a different ball game man i think even when i was gaming what mate i'd be going to my bed at like three and like while i'm still winding down my mum would be getting up and going to glasgow like at half <laughs> like getting up at half four they'd be ready to be in glasgow for six for things like b and i and all that and i'm Crazy. like the commitment levels mate i remember at that time thinking because i was what i mean I 18, 19, so still being a student and all that, and like thinking yeah. to myself, what, how is she doing that? How is she doing that? And uh, it's just so easy, bro. So yeah. easy to get, up, get locked in, man. And then that it also, like, the whole, like, we spoke about Naval earlier, inspiration being perishable. It's like, you're gassed at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, mate, and you want to work. 
just fucking do it, man. Right, Lock it, it in, man. Right, do it any time, So, aye, 100% mate, it's fucking, it's class, man. Um, one of the things you obviously we highlighted to begin with was the six times Young Entrepreneur of the Year. And they, just kind of what you highlighted there, the route that you took was different to the route that I potentially took. Um, and for you, like, what benefit? Because, see, because it's not my experience, when people come to me about things like the accelerator or whatever it may be, how do they get started in it? I don't have the advice because I've, I've not done it. So what would be your piece of advice to individuals that want to start that want the extra support? Um, how did you kind of go about it? Right, okay. Um, so first of all, I got involved with Scottish Enterprise mm. and that was just through a connection at my school. One of the teachers knew someone. I went and had a chat and then Scottish Enterprise advised me to enter for Scottish Edge. So this is where the kind of awards, the award winning young entrepreneur comes in. And I've leveraged that. So I've won Scottish Edge a few times, but that first time uh, when I entered Scottish Edge, what's it, Scottish Enterprise, were like, well, I think there's Scottish Edge, it's coming up next week. The deadline's like next week or something, or like tomorrow, or I can't even remember. Um, and that's for like 10 grand. And, I, and the next funding round isn't until October. So instead of studying for my higher maths exam, I went and done this big application for Scottish Edge and done a video and blah, 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 and done and, and pitched for it. So then, I ended up winning Scottish Edge and it was like the top prize. It was I can't mind if it was the Innovation Award or whatever, but that was massive for my business, like 15 grand and I was 17, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is like, this is a start. So once I was kind of got that title, um, the winning Scottish Edge or it was the wild card edge, yep. um, that gets you a lot of support because RBS are partnered with Scottish Edge. So they encourage you to go for the accelerator. It's all steps or steps to the game. However, you don't need to win Scottish Edge to, to actually take part in the accelerator. So just look for the big banks in your area. That's That would be my advice. Look at what support they can give you because there's so much out there. I know um, RBS were encouraging entrepreneurship and that's their whole thing over the past year and years after the financial crash. I don't know how much involvement they had. I think they were trying to recover their reputation or something. I don't know the story, but there's a lot of banks doing the same thing. Mm. So... Just try and take advantage of every free access to office space. If you've got a team, uh, money, if there's grants, go and take take everything you can. Because yep. that's what I've done and, and, it, and it's been really, really good. But it's not just taking and taking, not giving back. You know, now I'm back at Strathclyde as an ambassador or something like that. So mm -hmm. I think it's ambassador or supporter. What it means, I go into the, the accelerator that they have and I can do talks to other entrepreneurs, I can support, I can, you know, just all these different things, yep. which is brilliant because I like to be involved in that. Uh, and I like kind of chatting to other entrepreneurs and seeing their journey and, and seeing how we can relate and seeing what we can do. Yeah, so that's 100%, that. man. No, that's class one. Like an amazing piece of advice, mate, because it's something that I don't have any knowledge on. Um, the route that I wanted to go down was get myself to a position where if I could make the money without needing absolutely anything, it would put me in a position where no matter what, I'll still always be able to make money and deliver value. Yeah. Um, and it's something that both routes have led us to a path that we're incredibly happy about, mate. And it's just about finding, just like we said earlier about Gary Vee and stuff like that. It's like finding your own path that aligns with what you want to achieve and utilizing it. And for a lot of people, man, at that early stage, like I was fortunate enough to have gaming behind me um yeah. to be streaming to be doing what i loved anyways and using my spare time to build a somewhat sustainable business model people don't really have that leverage sometimes yeah. um or, or a lot of the time people don't have the leverage so think, having things access to opportunities or money or people whatever it may be it can open the door at those early stages um so yeah mate it's always a good thing to cover man without yeah. a doubt um there was one of the other businesses as well next is it next gen next gen yeah what did you want to talk about about that? Or? So Next Gen was a project that we never ended up taking on. Right. Um, and it was with, I think it was a chap called Aaron Reed, who's a really good young entrepreneur based in Falkirk, my hometown. We had a passion to like regenerate the, this, the town centre and all this and yeah. stuff. So Aaron's a great lad and he worked for me at Flux for a bit, which is cool. But uh, we thought, let's hear this massive vision. And I bought into it right away. I was like, uh, to take tech startups to Scotland, to the very kind of top yep. uh, wealth people in Scotland to invest in, um, trying to do something like Y Combinator in, in the States. So we thought, let's do this. 
Um, and in the end, we never took it forward because we had the connections to the investors and the people and we had the connections to the tech startups. There was someone actually messaged me last week looking to get involved and I was like, I'm sorry, it's not actually going. Um, but we found out that there was a roadblock because the high level investors actually wanted the kind of speed bumps and things in the way, not just to be taken direct to investor. Yeah. And it's quite cool to see that because I know that the route they'll take now is going through the accelerators and the banks and all this, and it might take them a few years. However, they will learn a lot from that in order to get connected to these investors. Obviously, they've got relationships in place, um, and that was it. So, again, that was something that was, like, kind of trialed and tested, yeah. and we had a lot of good kind of plans for it. But end of the day, it was it was going to be a non-profit thing, which is completely fine, um, but it probably wasn't going to provide as much value for both parties as we thought it was going to. Yeah, absolutely, mate. And the topic of bumps in the road and stuff like that, what has been your kind of biggest bumps in the road that stopped you from moving forward? Mate, there's nothing that stopped me from moving forward as such, you know, but I, I feel a lot of the time, like patience, it's just a sales game because yeah. I'm a product-based business for, for mm -hmm. Flux primarily. And there's been like, genuinely, there's been, I think at one point there was like three months and no sales. And it's like money coming out the bank, out the bank, out the bank, out the mm -hmm. bank. And I'm like, what's going to happen here? Am I going to, just going to have to liquidate the company and I'm just yeah. going to walk away, move to, move to bloody Bali or Thailand <laughs> or something. I'm fine with that. But I mean, like, I want to, <laughs> I want to finish my, my business yeah. here. Um, but it always come, there's ups and there's, there are ups and downs as well, you know, yeah. and I'm, I'm at the point now where it, it's class sales are really good. Um, and it's grown and grown and grown. So I'm going like this, but I, I'm not going to get complacent because I know you never know, I might have another month when there's no sales, yeah. which hopefully there's not because we're growing now and it always going well, but um, that could happen. Absolutely, man. I think it's something that's interesting. I'm not really, in hindsight, maybe to begin with, I probably would have, have had the same thought process as you with next gen. It's like you have access to these investors, you have access to these amazing ideas, bring them both together. It's a fucking recipe for success because the yeah. main thing they are needing is the money and then the flip side, the main thing they are needing is um, like obviously then the young individuals are needing the money the investors need the opportunities to invest in something early doors so it would make sense but i think probably through what you've learned yourself and probably what i feel like too where the bumps in the road the shit that does go wrong the three months of no sales that is what inspires a little bit of growth for you to actually move forward and also install conviction install everything that is required in order for us to actually achieve what we want to achieve yeah. so it doesn't really surprise me in hindsight to be fair ah it needs to be hard man it, it needs does. to be hard doesn't it it's it needs no, to be fucking hard it's not gonna be easy um aye that's definitely something that those the roller coaster of business is like required um i think it's like people speaking was it in in 30s or in threes they're like 33 percent of the time things will be amazing 33 percent of the time things will be average 33 percent of the time things will be shit and it's like just riding Riding it out, but also being in a position where when things are shit, things will get better. Um, but the flip side of that is when things are good, you know that at times there's going to be other yeah. problems that are going to occur. Um, I think probably what helped me with that is just staying actual present when things are. When things were relatively shit, it's like you do get yourself into a thinking habit of like, sounds so cliche when people are listening to it if they're not experienced it, but just like, you yeah. know, how can I actually, what can I learn from this? How can I actually move forward? What do I need to develop in order for me to reach the next level that I need to get to? Yeah. Um. If this is happening, then what was the blueprint when shit was working? You know, if yeah. shit's shit in the bed just now, what have I fucked up on? What have I missed out on? Um. And yeah, it's that just reaching that new level again and again, mate. It's fucking so powerful. It's man. how to like how to fill your time mm. as well when things are going bad. Because if you've no sales or in the process, or it doesn't matter, like what you're gonna do, yeah. like. My thing, I'm I'm pretty fortunate because I can, like, I usually focus the winters on, like, designing and innovating and engineering new products, which is really, I really enjoy that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and people could do the same in service space, maybe build systems, like, hands off, so when the next summer or when the next busy season comes along, you don't need to do anything, and you can go to Bali or, or yeah. Thailand or wherever you want to go, you know, no, uh, which is cool, so I think that's another good bit of advice, like, systems and innovating, kind of growing the business. Yeah. It's needed, man. Working on the business, mate, rather than working in it all yeah. the time. It's definitely something that, without it, like when we look at people like, imagine you've been following Hormozy recently. Ah, yeah. yeah, Hormozy's fucking unreal in it. Class. It speaks about seven hours of uninterrupted work, working on the business. Yeah. It's like, maybe at the early stages, laying the foundations, we'll, we'll have quite a lot of time that we need to put in. But people skip that, bro, and go straight to the, 
And the thing is, it is needed. Like when I spoke at UWS, you know, the piece of advice that was getting handy was like yours, Scottish Enterprise and stuff like that. Um, and when it came to me, because I didn't have that experience, I was like, for me, man, like I found a service that I believed was needed. I found a way to, you know, source source clients, yeah. source customers, give them the product or the service, and just have them rip it to shreds. What needs to be improved? How the fuck do I move forward? Yeah. I'm not some mad perfectionist. I'm not going to build a business model from scratch and think I am fucking nuts. It's not yeah. the case. Like it's going to need, need constant improvement. I think it's something that a lot of time people shy away from too, man. Like we have anonymous feedback that rolls out every month, mm-hmm. and it's like the questions. We have one or two questions where it's like, what do you enjoy? Um, you know, what is kind of the main element of why you in that you love? But majority of the questions is like rip us to shreds, man. What do you hate? Aye. What do you not want to see? Like, exactly. what are you sick of or whatever it may be? And those are the, like, people shy away from that shit, man. Especially early doors because they think maybe it's a perfectionist thing or maybe it's like school teachers are obviously not to fail. Yeah. And an element of that feedback is linked to failure because it's like, you know, you get told that an element of your service is fucking shit. It's like, Aye. it can be peak, it can feel shit, but it's like, welcoming it with welcoming it with open arms and just being like yeah let's fucking move forward with this man totally man um totally. what kind of feedback have you had or what kind of stuff have you had from maybe mentors and stuff like that the areas that you've really had to improve on try to think in terms of mentors it's maybe been a while but more something that comes springs to mind more is product feedback you know mm. a, a physical product um there sometimes can be problems and things like that so listen if i've designed something for four years and i put it to market and someone doesn't like it i'm fucking raging you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah, i want yeah. to fix that i want to make that better for them um and that did happen so we used to you know the beads that you get with your shoes your new shoes silica beads yeah, yeah yeah so i used to use that in my product right? right and that was to absorb the moisture out the the flux blow pipe for the bagpipes mm. um and it got to the stage where see after like like maybe like a few months of playing it they started to like they, they start to like break and stuff like this and they start they, it, it caused the reaction with the plastic and oh, yeah. the kind of metal plated bore that we had inside it to cool and condense and blah 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 and that caused a problem and a lot of customers weren't happy mm. and there'd be i just replaced them i just replaced them and replaced them so i thought Fuck, i can't keep doing this it's no sustainable you know mm. so over that winter i done a shit ton of research um a shit ton of prototyping and i went out and found this material that absorbed four much four times more moisture can be reused all this kind of stuff and it, and it was so much easier to deal with so when the beads used to get wet you'd take them out and you put them in the oven and it would take half an hour and you need to filter them all in they're pushing all the flare and all this stuff right and it's a lot of hassle um however i didn't see it when i first released the product i thought it was easy it was like funnel blah blah xyz boom you're mm-hmm. sorted but now i've just made it even easier and i've not had a single bad word about the product since yeah and that shows like i suppose it's from a product design like background it's continuous improvement and development get a product out there to market because my product was due to launch in march before the pandemic yeah. and i was like i'll postpone it to august so i did middle of the pandemic launched it but that was a good thing you need revenue mm. you know get the sales replace the old ones with the customers whatever and then um, just continue improving the product and people see that mm-hmm. and people recognize that in your brand and your person and they appreciate that and i think that's sustainable business mm-hmm. absolutely it's definitely something that it's like the reciprocity given when people don't necessarily expect it. and a lot of times when you think about when you've not bought from someone again it's usually because it their approach to whatever has went wrong doesn't align with your values yeah. in it so it's like your values was to replace them because something went wrong you ah. need to take accountability for that um even though it was something that you'd tried and tested and sometimes you can't see what is it the wood for the trees like nice. just can't see what's what's in front of you mate so i think a lot of people could apply that whether it is to a product-based business or a service-based you are going to meet clients or you're going to bring on clients that are putting them through the correct betting process and you think they're absolutely unreal and they they potentially could be absolutely unreal and the feedback like yeah. that is given is so important at those stages where when you find your ideal clients and they start being brutally honest about the things that they think could help you move forward it's like listen to it man implement Aye. it you know if there's like a good few people telling you about something like and you trust them and you built a good relationship with them it's like that's probably something i should listen to man, and kind of implement so 
there was something that we spoke about when we were grabbing some scran mate and it was about you being shy as a kid yeah mate yeah yeah i used to i used to cry going to birthday parties mate just be a wee loser i think i had pals <laughs> in that but i don't know i can't even remember <laughs> so um it's all this business fried my brain man can't even mind it but um i used to like cry going to birthday cry going into school and all yeah. this when i was a wee boy and then um I, I, the kind of turning point for that was when i started playing the bagpipes right. and then i got good at something and i got recognition for that and i was like fuck i like being i like being good at something i like yeah. being like getting this feedback um and i still see that to this day you know if i'm working really hard i like to be complimented on it it, it, yeah. it does spur me forward reverse as well obviously you like getting a bit of hassle and so you can improve your business but compliments are brilliant and and i think some naturally try to give a lot of people that have worked for me or who i'm working with and be like mate that was really fucking good mm. like keep doing that it's unreal and it helps everyone so that's that's the kind of turning point for me was actually learning the bagpipes getting into a competitive environment i, I believe that a lot of folk argue it for like um like a combat sport and things i think yeah. that's brilliant but the same competitive side goes for everyone whether it's football bagpiping musical instrument whatever high performance and um high pressure environment and a high performance environment i think if you can develop that for when you're 10 years old up until even until you're like 16 like six years of that alongside your school work and everyone else keeps you out of trouble gets you good at something and it really really develops your personal skills absolutely man i definitely think it's something that when you become amazing at one thing you start to realize that that can be replicated in any other area that, uh, whether it's bagpiping for me it was gaming it's like exactly. taking that and applying it elsewhere um i guess what i was maybe pinpointing with the shyness is when i meet a lot of people they have a you'll do, meet it yourself amazing product or an amazing service but they're introverted or they just cannot sell what would be your kind of like piece of advice to people at that kind of early stage where they i they're struggling with that kind of thing just don't give a fuck you know what i mean i used to be like when i started flux my whole brand was going to do something different for the market so it's not just like uh like tartan branding and all this i want to be dead corporate and that, that shows through being in the maybe the accelerator maybe my business and journey all these different things it is quite a corporate environment so i was like i want to do this professional thing and i, I enjoyed it for a bit wearing wearing the suit and all this and i got to the point where let's let's stop typing emails like kind regards and have a splendid day <laughs> yeah. i just sign every message r at the end mm -hmm. and it's like cheers for your time thanks it's like talk how you are it's nice waking up and actually being yourself and i find like when i was speaking to people at the event on on saturday there where i was selling the product folk really liked that of its oh, senior yeah. personality and not shoving something down someone's throat mm -hmm. there was a guy came up to me and he was like i use a moisture control system already and i was like all right do you have problems like do you still get like problems with moisture in your pipes and he was like no i was like that's class i was like you don't need this mate. You'd, that's brilliant for you but if you do come back like i'm here yeah. it's no problem at all and I, and I think that's what it's all about being genuine transparent and confident in your product amazing advice man because it's something that a lot of people let's not necessarily slip but when they come into the business world they kind of think that they need to fit in some form of suited and booted or looking apart and it's something that yeah I never gave a fuck about it, the day. it's a weird one man like it really depends i feel like our generation young business what you're trying to do didn't need to be in a shirt and tie right mm -hmm. but there's a lot of other industries that you, you that you maybe do like i'm not saying that there's no right or wrong but i feel like when i'm pitching i, I need to wear a shirt collar mm -hmm. like i i just i don't know if it's a, a subconscious thing or whatever but i feel more confident like when i'm talking numbers especially big numbers i feel like I don't know maybe that's stemming back to the root of my upbringing and, and business but yeah i feel i need to be presentable um in this kind of older fashioned way and i like that mm -hmm. it's totally fine and i know there's folk who do the opposite and that's amazing um yeah. but it's a weird one it's like we all have these alter egos and we try to juggle them yeah. and it's like what am i going to wear today who am i going to be today what am i doing today and i like it i really like that it's quite a strange it excites yeah. me like it's a strange one i'm like put my business hat on the day put my piping hat on the day mm. you know i like that yeah it's definitely something maybe we are because for me i look at it in this the aspect of like like i want to be covering head to toe with tattoos everywhere yeah. like i'll happily have tattoos in my face and stuff like that. i won't do not care Aye. um and for me i always look at it the same way where i say i was covering tattoos from head to toe 
in someone I was in a business meeting with someone and it was very clear that we could you know change a lot of lives make a lot of money yeah why would it matter what I was wearing or how I looked exactly and how we could move like if you if I'm telling you just now I can make you a million quid this year it's like you're really going to look at my tattoos and be like nah mate you know right. what nah yeah. not going to happen so I I guess I mean the pitching aspect because I was trying to think about what I used to do to get prepped for gaming uh, when I used to compete it was just locked in man locked in not speaking to anyone that was kind of my zonal were you were you shy growing up as well mm, my mum would probably say yeah not right. proper like i definitely developed like i'm 100 percent introverted but when you come into business it's like either you just fucking get over it mate or you continue to be that way so for me it was like i read a lot of books studied a lot of people that i admired figured out what i admired about them mm -hmm. and also figured out what it actually was that I admired about them in the first place. Like, is it just, is it how they're talking to people? Is it what they're doing? Is it the conviction? Is it, was, is it their service? Whatever it may be. Um, so I guess to answer your question, it probably was pretty shy and gaming was probably an element of like, not necessarily an escape, but I didn't really have to commit to engagement every single day, but I kind of had the mindset of just like being the best at whatever I'd done and then that would do the talking. That was always my mindset towards it, whereas in business, unless you're developing a product or, you know, there's a lot of it is selling and getting to that place where you can only let your skills do the talking for so long unless yeah. you're in a very specific niche where you can get paid in direct proportion of how good you are at something. Yeah. Um, so I guess I just, I just decided that something had to change. Yeah, no, it's just the reason the reason why I said that is because when you said you're about to game, mm. you, you're kind of in the zone, didn't speak to yeah. anyone, dead kind of introverted in that sense, you know what I mean? Mm. And I'm the exact same. I yeah. do like my own space, um, especially when I'm about to perform, when I'm yeah. about to pitch. I just, I can't, I can't be arsed getting into a small talk with anyone or yeah. and it's going to distract me, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that is a thing about, being in that high performance environment, you're wired in, you're, mm -hmm. you are totally dialed and I love it. Like, I admit, you're the same, you stopped gaming and I kind of stopped competitive bagpiping for a bit. Yeah. These, this kind of past couple of months, I've been getting back into it. I went to a few competitions and it's like, mate, it's, it's really, it's a really nice feeling. It is quite cool to be back in that environment. Because I wanted, that was a question I wanted to ask you, which was, have you found a way to replicate the same competitive environment within business? the same feeling uh i think when i'm pitching, pitching. when i'm pitching or, or or speaking to people when i'm trying to sell that's what it is when i'm trying to sell when i'm trying to make money when i'm trying to put food on the table man like it genuinely i think money is a big motivator for me mm. and i find i do actually get the same feeling now that you said that class question when i'm performing yeah. as to when i'm pitching because you need to be confident in what you're saying and you need to be confident in what you're playing on the bagpipes and you need to know what you're talking about you need to know your technique and when you're getting judged on it in a competition or an investor's listening to you they're judging you mm -hmm. are they going to say yes or no um that's really there is a lot of parallels there that's really cool i like that love it man something i explored mainly because i felt like i was trying to create higher performance situations within business when they weren't needed um because just like for yourself when you're competing um in gaming every millisecond is like you can't put a foot wrong you need to be locked in like in business we have too much time to make decisions mm -hmm. there's too much window for thought whereas yeah. when you're competing it's like for you it could be a couple of minutes but you need to like no mistakes locked in yeah um for me it could be like a fucking draw three day tournament but every single time that i'm in a game which could be 10 minutes 15 minutes at a time there's no window for any mistakes yeah. and if you make a mistake somebody else is in a game that's not made a mistake so they are ahead of you and yeah that's feeling in business mate is yet to be replicated for me yeah. but i'm also i'm yet to be in that environment like pitching or well, it may be, and I'd probably imagine it would make me feel the same way. Um, and when you speak about selling too, 
it's a buzz, but at the same time, it's like competing, mate. I've had times where I've fucking would be a teammate and just naturally my whole body is lit up and I've jumped up and I've started shouting and screaming and getting <laughs> gassed and fucking, you know, like even the clips on my stream, man, of us, we came third in, a fina in the Fnatic Invitational, which we were sitting first at the fourth game and we won the first game and then the second game, I believe we came second. That put us in like pole position to win and see when we won that first game, mate. Honestly, bro, you would have seen me doing laps around my gaff, mate. Well, as soon as it, it's like that feeling that it's like you can't even control it, man. You're just up, shouting, bashing the table, going yeah. after your nut. It's like, how the fuck do you create that mate, in business, man? I done the same last week. Mm. I was, we'll get on to this again, but in property, I was working on a on a deal, like a direct to vendor deal, when we're looking at a commercial unit, two flats above, and blah blah blah. And it was this guy that was selling them and he was on holiday. He was an old boy who never took his phone with him or anything like this. And his phone and basically get trying to try and get direct to the seller instead of going through like three different agents he had on it. It was a bit of a mess. Mm. So I was phoning, I phoned like the Indian takeaway in the village and I said, can you go into the pub? Give me the phone, put like speak to the bar manager, put me on the phone to her. Just try to get to the owner of the property. I phoned the bowling club. I phoned the butchers. I got told to fuck off because he was watching the football. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, basically, end, ended up getting. Um, he ended up getting my number and he phoned me, and I was absolutely buzzing, mate. Mm. I got off the phone. I was running a bit. <laughs> I was shouting. I was like phoning my business partner. I was like, "This is class. This is brilliant, mate." Yeah. And it wasn't even like it wasn't even a sale. Never made any money, but I was a lead. Uh, I, and I was absolutely buzzing about it, man. And as soon as you said that the other night, John, that really, really resonates to me. That that means like stands out to me that that's what I should be doing. Hundred percent. It's like that flow state. I know, like Jimmy Carr spoke about it on Ballast podcast, and it's like, it is man, I don't know flow state, doing what you truly desire. It's fucking unreal, mate. And it's just what we spoke about earlier, but like, why work at eleven o'clock and Saturday night, mate? Fucking lock it in, mate. Yeah. Do what you want. Yeah. Um. So on the topic of property, then, what made you want to? You said obviously just there. That's clear what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. Um. How come it's took you not necessarily this long? You're fucking twenty one, mate. Do you know what I mean? But obviously, it wasn't the first thing you moved into. Was that just from a capital aspect, or is it just like you've been exposed to more and more incredible people within property? Yeah, exposed to more and more. Um. So. The company I'm working with is called Rood Group, Real Estate, Wealth and Development, mm -hmm. and they're based in Falkirk. And it's these guys who worked in corporate for years as um, like in business development for offshore oil companies and all this, right? And they got to a stage where they thought, fuck it, we want to do our own property thing. So it's been three years and I think they've scaled, I think they've got over 250 buy -to -let properties, which is class, like it's amazing the rate they're scaling. Class. The portfolio is worth like over 25 mil. Um, and they're cash flowing a ridiculous amount and all these things and that can be done in such a short period of time I think the reason why it excites me is because you've got obviously a real asset but something that you can recycle cash with good debt like I love learning about cash how money moves how um, like properties the like it's, it's crazy how money moves in property mm -hmm. um, so basically anyway and I think it was like over a year ago uh, myself and my, my pal Ryan Retson, who's working with this company now, um, we seen these guys in Falkirk buying up all these buildings, making them better, and we thought, fuck, we love this. That's mm. class. So we sent them a message on Facebook, these two guys, and we we're like, let's let let can we come down and just get a chat and like see what you're doing? So we went down and had a chat and, and they invited us to an event a couple of months later. They they sponsored the big music festival and blah blah blah. And they had us in their VIPs and we thought, these are good guys. And they, and they've got like, they've got such a good head on them, and 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 they're so switched on, mm. um. And I was really, I really, really gravitate towards that, um. And uh, over time, I just developed a like naturally, just developed an interest in, in property, um. So basically, the last eight weeks, I've been doing a, a sourcing apprenticeship. Uh, this chap called Connor Tracy, is one of the he is the the top property sourcer in Scotland. Um, he basically is running a sourcing, appre a sourcing apprenticeship to develop all these like high-end property sourcers because there is a lot of shit out there. You know, when I'm phoning the kebab shop and I'm phoning the bowling club trying to get someone's number for a, for a lead and a deal, that's the effort that it takes. It means you can actually charge mere fees. You get a bigger discount. 
you give the client what they need as well. It's not just getting something for home report and putting it out to a, a group of random investors and fucking you about, you know, and it, it's why I don't actually post a lot about what I'm doing in properties because I, I don't really care. You know, I'm building these business relationships naturally this time and I'm, I'm really enjoying it because no one wastes my time. Yeah. And I like that. So anyway, basically long term, I want to have my, my own portfolio and um, hopefully with my business partner, um, Ryan Retson in the future. But first, like, I'm really taking it a step at a time. I just want to do some deals. I just want to build some good relationships. Um, and obviously I've got a connection to a lot of people with finance. So when the time comes, um, I can really start to scale massively in property and build my own um, buy to let portfolio, but looking to get in commercial and all this. So there's loads of different stages to it, but right now uh, I'm at the beginning and, and finding finding deals. Absolutely, mate. Sounds like you're truly immersed in it, which is fucking yeah. dynamite. Um, one of the things that I pick on from what you're saying, though, is the, your ability to deploy patience and being okay with the fact that it's going to take... Mate, and something that I was speaking to my pal Robert about this yesterday, mm -hmm. and see, we all like the like the crypto craze and all this, and I think like we've all been through it. Yeah. And it is like, although you say to yourself, this isn't a get-rich-quick thing, two years when your money's down and it's no up, you're like, F fucking hell man <laughs> what's happening with this and i was fine like i was totally devoted to like um putting money into crypto and learning about it and and all this but um obviously your, your patience wears a bit thin um but with property i, I genuinely i feel i'm all right starting at the very beginning mm -hmm. like I'd, i'm not relying on this for an income just yet so i really want to take my time meet the right people um and and, and do real business yeah I think so many people could learn from that, mate, because when a lot of people would are they're in such a rush, man, like when they first start, and I think everyone is like probably a lot of my reflections over the last few months, man, have definitely been that, you know, to begin with, I was looking for that silver bullet that this is where everything's gonna change. This is the person that's gonna change my life, this is the mentor, this is the, yeah. the introduction, whatever it may be, this is the client. Um, but in reality it's it's in here, man. And like finding the position where Knowing what to do, who to do it with, and when to do it are all three main components for you to move forward at a rate where you start in, instead of thinking in fucking what can I make happen today, you're thinking in weeks. Instead of thinking about weeks, you're thinking in months, and it goes all the way up to to thinking in in decades, mate. And it's something that people can't grasp at that early stage, man. And it's like when you get to that place where you are at peace with time, so blissful, mate. Yeah. You're not in a rush anymore, bro. You're not like race against the time. Like, and I think that directly links to what we're speaking about with the desire thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will feel like backs up against the wall. You'll create an environment where you have to survive and yeah. you have to then move forward. Absolutely. I've done it for myself, like starting, starting out, man. Um, but it's just realizing that the only way we lose our Mosey style yeah. is if we quit, mate. So it's like, we're not going to quit, bro. So Too right. just continue to move forward. Aye, man, you're bang on with that. It's totally. It's all about patience, consistency, having a long-term mindset on something. Yeah, that's really, really, really powerful. Um, yeah, man, love it, man. And then we kind of spoke briefly about Denmark. You went there to study over there. Yeah. Also, you you kind of explained a bit about their would it be ecosystem as so you for producing entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, I find it fucking interesting, mate. Like I thought it was mental in terms of. The system that they've got set up over there for university and also obviously i, I didn't exactly have an, an experience with uni but i was like that's class i didn't find uni beneficial pretty mm -hmm. much at all um whereas you've had a far different experience than when we spoke about it previously it's class man because we've we've came from completely different routes like you've highlighted completely different journeys but we've both learned so much from those routes and uni for you was something that was from what I've gathered, you've really enjoyed uni and you've got a lot of benefit from the engineering side of things. Would you say that is the case? I'd say I've not enjoyed it. Okay. But it's got me, what I've got out of it, I've really enjoyed. Okay. Um, like the entrepreneurship side of the university, how they've supported me, incredible. Absolutely amazing. That's taken me on leaps and bounds. That's given a lot for my business and I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and I should totally appreciate the education, which I do. The, educa the educational contents, uh, it's good. But I mean, studied online for two years. I went for 
I have an incredible relationship with my teachers and things at school. They treated you with so much respect. I never got the grades to get into uni, so I went to college for a year. And and I, and the le the lecturers or teachers, whatever you call them, didn't didn't treat us very well. Yeah. I didn't enjoy going in in mornings. I didn't look forward to getting up in the morning, and that put a real bad start to actually the start of the education. However, when I moved into second year at, at, at the university at Strathclyde, met a lot of, uh, met a lot of cool staff, met a lot of cool people, uh, made some brilliant friends who who spurred me on. So that's been excellent. The actual teaching side of it and the content. I don't know if it's just because I didn't want to be an engineer anymore. Mm. Um, as such, I've maybe been exposed to business maybe too much for my yeah. age. I don't know. Um, I'm so much more interested in my projects and all this than, than educational content um, to be an engineer. But don't really enjoy the teaching. Don't really enjoy getting taught in that traditional way. Um, but when I moved to Denmark, um, that's when obviously it was all in person teaching yeah. and that was a big change for me and I and I really enjoyed that the caliber of people I met in Denmark were incredible and um, this is the second best engineering uni in the world I think it's first for research mm -hmm. this uni is doing work for like SpaceX Tesla all this cool shit like cool people mm -hmm. you know what I mean and that was really inspiring going into this um I went into this class I just call it a classroom it was a building it was an entrepreneurship building ex-tech entrepreneurship building right i used to go in there every single day even if i never had a class i used to sit there and there's folk building fucking rockets i'm i'm selling bits of bagpipe and i'm doing emails and there's someone sitting in front of me building a fucking rocket that's going to the moon man and i'm like this is on how cool is that mm -hmm. like i never got that when i was in scotland i'm getting this in denmark i like this i want to stay here mm -hmm. so anyway like one of the goals i wrote it down before i went to denmark no clue how i was going to do it i want to start a business here I've never been to Denmark in my life. I never knew they were building rockets and, and that in the uni. Um, so went and ended up taking this class called X Tech Entrepreneurship. And this is really, really cool. You get, there's 45 teams. It just shows you how much money they've got. And, it, and it's brilliant. And, it, and, and they put it into the right things. So 44, 45 teams. Each team got one and a half grand. I think it was equivalent. Um, 1,500 pounds. And you got 13 weeks to develop a product or a service or whatever um some people were making solar panel business folk were designing um carbon recycling would put carbon in boreholes and it would i don't know regenerate the the fossil it would basically make fossil fuels again i don't know um so we did the same thing so for 13 weeks we designed a product um and at the end you'd pitch for investors and then we got twenty thousand kroner which i think is like five grand or something i'm not sure um and then now we're in the final for what is it 10 grand in december i'm not sure but anyway we did that and the product that we made was a really really cool lamp and um, basically this is a technology that it's a light that has very very little shadows when you put your hand under it and it does it through multiple diffusion plates and a lot of cool stuff um can i don't think i actually speak too much about it but i'll just go for it man I, I'll just go for it john <laughs> the Danish that, police can't get me in glasgow man that's right. true, really <laughs> i'll not get back in but um <laughs> So anyway, we made this uh, cool product and out of the 45 teams we, we we pitched, we won the funding. And another thing that stood out for me was working with all internationals, you know. I was from Scotland, uh, my teammates were from Mexico, Faroe Islands, Denmark, Spain, Greece. Wow. I was like, this is, I didn't get, again, I'm comparing everything to what I get back yeah. in Scotland and I'm not getting any of this. Yeah. And I had an incredible time. I started a business. A cool product which should be to market in 12 months i think it will be used for in the electronics manufacturing industry maybe for surgeons and dentists for intricate work if you've got a lamp with no shadows that's that's a that's a game changer um so that's what we're working towards with the the danish project and i'll be going back there hopefully very soon to to work on that and prototype and do all the cool stuff that, that's involved with a product related business Fucking hell, mate. That's blew my mind. Because that's an element of like, this world I've never been exposed to. Like, product development, engineering. Like, my brain can't even fathom how that would even be possible, mate. Mate, you ever had a project or when you're working on YEN mm. and you're doing just, like, you're doing just, like, maybe work that some folk would see as tedious. Yeah. But 
you really, really enjoy it. For example, I get it where it's like a buzz. It's like a hum, like you're in the zone. I get it when I make content because I really think about it and I can take hours on it and only make two posts or whatever, but I really enjoy it. Complete waste of time, but I'm in that yeah. zone. And I get it with prototyping. When I'm 3D printing at the laser cutter behind my computer, making 3D models, CAD files, all this kind of stuff, like I'm thinking and I'm making something and it takes me forever, but it just time passes like that. Yeah. I know artists get it a lot. They think it's two minutes. It's been five hours and they, they make a piece of art. Mm. And do you get that? With gaming and gaming. business and business to be fair. Yeah. It, Cause the question I was going to ask you was, do you think entrepreneurship taught you to become more resourceful? Because what you spoke about was you've maybe been exposed to too much business, like at this kind of early stages. And I think for us, when we maybe look at things like uni or whatever it may be, it's like, we we'll just go and find the answer. Mm -hmm. well if we can't find it online then i'm sure we'll know somebody that can help us move forward yeah and tony robbins kind of speaks a lot about it like it's never necessarily about the resources but it's about how resourceful you actually are um do you think that's something you've developed through entrepreneurship or do you think it's the like you're speaking about now the engineering side of things it's i'd say if, probably in the foundations of engineering stuff man because mm -hmm. i don't know I, I was ripping things to shreds and reverse engineering stuff for when I was quite a young age. Um, but saying that, I think that resourceful side could be seen in two aspects. Yep. I used to sell things at school to make money um, just so I could go on like a, like a water sports trip with my pals at school mm -hmm. um, because because maybe their parents could afford it, but mine, mine couldn't. So I was like, fuck, I need to be resourceful here. Mm -hmm. So my mum used to make tablet and I used to go into sell it, uh, school and sell it for a pound a bar. Class. And I ended up saving, I think I made like 300 quid and I was able to go on this water sports trip and that was brilliant. And that taught me for a young age to be resourceful in terms of money, finding finding money, making money. Um, aye, man, aye. That's classic you've done that. Like you're just kind of like knocking heads together and like coming up with a way to, to make the money. It's yeah. definitely something that, yeah. That was sick, mate. That's fucking class. Because I, I thought you were going to hit it with something like I used to buy, um, first years weren't allowed up to the van. Aye. So I would sneak up and get some bonbons Aye. and then sell the bonbons, a single bonbon <laughs> for like a, I have much it was, so it was like 50p, 50p for a bag. Right. And you could sell like one bonbon for like 10p and there'd be like 20 of them in there. Yeah, yeah. So you'd four extra cash. Class. Which is just like, <laughs> as a kid, you're like, this is mental, man. How's this happening? Aye. There were so many other people that were doing it too and it was just like whether or not you had the balls to just go to the van and yeah. maybe get caught or maybe not, but it would put you in a position where if you came back with like fucking five bags, mate, and now you've got all these kids that are all craving sugar and they can't get it, it's aye. like, aye, I'll pay whatever, the, yeah. whatever it takes, man. So I also used to spend my, all my cash on match attacks when I was younger. Easy, yeah. And that was aye. like, you had to be resourceful with then getting scran. Like, mom would give me, in high school, it was four pounds for dinner money. For like break and lunch. Yeah. I mean, I'd splash like three quid of it in match tax and try and find a way to budget the, <laughs> the quid for the rest of the day on Scrad and that. Um but it's interesting, I think like your financial blueprint, did you develop that through books or education or was that something that you no? Nah, I was never a big reader growing up. Mm. And more so now. I realise that there's a there's so much value, you know, if if you could have like five mi minutes with, or if you could have like an hour with Elon Musk or Barack Obama, you totally would. Yeah. Who would say no to that? So why not read their book? They've went and they've went and written everything they know. Yeah. Like, so read it, mm -hmm. you know, like, taking knowledge for other people is really, really important. Uh, but when I was younger, it was all just, um, I used to just play the bagpipes all the time, man. I used to go busking and I, and I never really read books so much. I feel like everything I've learned is, a lot through just my own experience mm. um, and, and going out there and, and doing things. Um, I'd say that's how I've extracted most of the knowledge that I have. Yeah. It's interesting because I feel like a lot of people get stuck in their the loop of not realising that their beliefs are made up based on their own experiences and they'll have beliefs around money or business or whatever that will just hold them back completely and they won't be able to not necessarily shift them, but it will take a book or a person or whatever it may be I mate, to be honest, the, the four hour work week by mm. Tim Ferriss, I read this a few years ago when I'd just left school and that changes your attitude towards how money works. Yeah. Rich Dad, Poor Dad I've read as well. That's probably like the first one that everyone reads to mm. realise the, the power of money and how to use it and things like that. And that's good. But um, 
because I had a product based business and it's all about building systems um, and how to get your your kind of product out there without you doing anything. It's all how to, how to like mitigate lifestyle risk. Um, it's quite a weird one, um, but really, really enjoyed that book um, when I was younger. And that was like a a big shift for me, I'd say. Yeah. What was the kind of financial blueprint you picked up from like your mum or your, your parents as a whole? Did you have one in general or were you always just kind of like time managing money? No, no, we... We never had a lot of money as such. Mm. We we still go on, we still go like a, on your family holiday and things. Yeah. But um, it was very much like, we, I was out shopping and my mum would be like, "Didn't you tell your dad about that?" You know that like negative yeah, kind yeah. of thing. And then um, for example, so when I was fifteen, I got this scholarship and bursary to go to this massive private school, um, and incredible, incredible school. Loved the school, got so much out of it. But when I first went, I hated it because I didn't fit in. Mm. You know, I was a folker and I spoke like this and everyone else is doesn't doesn't speak like that. Mm. They're no bad people, just different. Um and anyway, I, I started, I think it took about six months for me begging to move back to Falkirk. <laughs> it was a boarding school as well, so again, completely out of my depth. Mm. Um and then something just clicked and I fell fell in love with the place. And then after three years I I, I ended up being the head the head boy of that school. Mm um and that was a massive game changer for my for my people skills but the thing is my mum and dad never went on holiday for four years so they could afford to send me to this school obviously it's i think the i don't know how much the school is again but um my mum and dad were paying a fraction of that and and they had to sacrifice you know yeah. and that's what made me realize the value of money mm -hmm. and now it's like i've never had any financial help from my parents or anything i've, I've worked for everything i've had which is, I know that sounds really cliche, but it's true. So mm. I kind of resonate with it. Um, and it's brilliant. It's brilliant to see that myself, my brother, I've got two older brothers. We're all working. We're all making our money. My mum's went and bought a nice new car. And I'm like, fuck, you fucking go, mum. You treat yourself. Because four years, you never went on holiday. And I know that sounds like coming for a place of privilege. Like folk, some folk never go on holiday. Mm. But that's just my situation. That's my upbringing, you yeah. know. And, and it, it does take a lot of sacrifice so that's the kind of the attitude with money i've had yeah it's powerful man it's definitely something that i realized through my own financial blueprint similar to what you kind of experienced where uh, my mom was a single parent so it was like her attitude towards money was survival it wasn't like you know bringing things that like we'd go on you know a holiday every now and again and it was like mom had a really good job but it wasn't it's like she's just a single parent with two kids and a roof over her Aye. head like it's like you know that whether it's classed is like a good job or a good salary um you know quickly disappears um yep. and i never went out of pocket mate my mum always the new cods the Aye. new fifas they put the you new, first oh everything mate and totally man i remember i had an experience actually which i'll share because it's it's kind of linked to this and it was um so an element of my programming that i, that I established um through through somebody else was like the individual was always uh, not necessarily skint but he was always like like he, money was scarce for him um i remember one time i lost a fiver and i got grounded and he was livid that i'd lost this fiver with well, if he's not that kind of stuff and my mum was the complete opposite mate like there was one of the times where she gave me 40 pound to go down and buy the new fifa and I lost the 40 quid from my house to Asda, which wasn't far. Aye. Really, really small distance. Uh, trodden along, fucking buzzing, hoping it's not sold out, Aye. all this kind of patter. Lost the 40 quid, mate. Uh, started greeting and all that because I was like, Aye. this means a lot to my mum. I don't know why fucking, like, I fucked this up. Like, there was this whole, like, the scarcity that had been installed. Um, when I got back, I was like, it's fine, man. No stress I'm at all. Out. Here's another 40 quid, actually. I'll come down with you. Mm -hmm. and i'll make sure you, you you get it maybe we'll find the 40 quid on the way down and we didn't yeah. but that lesson was the flip side like you know if i was grew up in a scarce environment as opposed to someone that my mum wasn't tight with cash at all mm -hmm. so both of those kind of like my blueprint was save for long periods of time then splash it so you're i read the four hour work week read rich dad poor dad also read secrets of the millionaire mind mm -hmm. that was a book that he referred, T. Harvey Ecker refers to your financial blueprint, how you develop it, how you in, how it's installed in you. 
and just how to reprogram it, man. And I recommend it to a lot of people. It's one of those things that was my first ever book. So mm-hmm. the impact it has on me will be different to like if you picked it up just now, it would have the same impact. Yeah. Um but yeah, help me understand like we don't come out the womb thinking we're shit at maths, bro. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? We're it's developed Aye. as thing goes on. So having that constant mindset and probably for you with bagpiping, we game another piece of content, you spoke about content earlier on, where I broke down the stats so of where I was in COD as opposed to the likelihood of succeeding in business. And even if I was to class myself the top 500 in the world at COD, 100 million active players, that puts me at 0.00001% of players. And in business, or even just in life in, in general, there's 56 million millionaires on this planet. Mm-hmm. There's 7.75 billion people. That's a 0.72% chance of becoming a millionaire. My stats within COD, the 100 million active players, as opposed to becoming a millionaire, that was actually harder statistically than becoming a millionaire. Aye. So much harder that it's like a joke if you actually compare them both together. And that was the turning point for me. I say it all the time, man. I even Mental. said it to my mate Jack today, man. Jack taught me maths when I was 15 because I got 13% in my prelim. He was in higher maths while I was doing that five. Sat with me for six weeks during study leave. Got me up to 67%. I got my exam. Class. He then also brought me into, he introduced me to competitive COD. It's like, sat on the day, man, just getting them inspired. And I'm like, mate, what we've done in COD is mental. Like, actually deep the stats, actually deep, like, look at this. What the fuck's telling us that we can't move into an industry like business, not say an industry, move into business where you get paid in direct proportion of the results that you generate, the value that you offer. Yeah. In COD and gaming and stuff at the stages we were at, man, we were going to events, mate, and, like, be negative cash just from going. Yeah. Like, even if we, like, we never won tournaments at that early stage but it was like i would pay i remember i went to birmingham when i was 14 my mum and my gran paid for all of it with my birthday money to to go that was my present and i was buzzing with it and they must have paid like a grand for me to go and the price pool was five grand which would get split between four yeah. players so even if i won i wasn't Aye. i'd make like 200 quid mm-hmm. um and like when I was explaining to Jack, like today, I was like, we can move into an environment where you become the top 0.000001% of business owners. You're a billionaire. It's yeah. not fucking millionaire. It's yeah. you're a B, bro. And it's like, for you with bagpiping, it's the same aspect. Like imagine the amount of people you competed against yeah. to get to where you, are, where you are today. It's like a lot of people are doing shit that they are fucking incredible at and they don't realize that they can take that, create the same desire, create the same motivator. For me, like, Providing a service, getting paid in direct proportion of the value that I deliver. Biggest no-brainer ever, mate. Yeah. Um, went about a tangent there, mate, but it was pure passion. Mate, Loved it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And and as you're saying there, like, getting paid directly proportional, that's a thing when we're speaking about upbringing. I think it is important for folk to obviously know the value of money. You know when you were saying you lost your 40 quid for your FIFA? You're thinking... Fuck, my mum would have had to work like four four hours mm. for that, or whatever, you know. Um, and that's the same how I was with my parents growing up. If they bought me something, I'd always think, fuck, my mum's put like eight hours work into that. Or like, I think I think it's important to realise that. But I also think it's important to as soon as you turn sixteen, go and get a job. You know, I used to work in a pub. I used to work in Tesco. I was stocking bananas. I was a delivery driver. I used to do all this, right? And that makes you not so much realize the value of money but realize the value of time Mm. and obviously when you can make your time work for you you can you can do it pretty well and and that's that's the thing in business i'm actually another thing i'm doing i'm i'm doing loads of stuff right now this summer i'm doing an internship at highland spring and i get paid 10 pound an hour and i go up and i'm like right i'm gonna have to work for eight hours 80 quid a day blah 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 but what if i sell one blowpipe Mm. which usually happens well, that's my day covered, man. You know what I mean? Like, if you put the time in when you're young or whatever, or make your business, and then your product will sell itself eventually, and then you're sorted financially. Um, and it's mental. The reason I'm actually doing the internship is because it's worth 10 credits next semester in my final year, which means I can drop two classes. So it means I have more time to push my property stuff. Wow. So it's like an investment of time. It's annoying that I have to do it. And I'm getting a lot of skills from it, to be honest, which is okay. But 
I hate the thing of going in and sitting for eight hours. And when this podcast is released, my boss will listen to this. <laughs> and I did enjoy my time there, mate. <laughs> I genuinely did. <laughs> I enjoyed my time, but I want to enjoy my time on my own terms. <laughs> my boss is a lovely guy. My boss is a really lovely guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was thinking I was wondering where you were going to take that. I don't know if you're just going to be. You like, love my yeah. boss, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's one of those things, man. I think it's fuck me. It's like when you truly break down how much you're getting paid. Even I think things like commuting, um, whether it's bus, train, time. I'm two hours oh, commuting man. a day. I'm like, what? I get up at six, leave at seven, then I get back to the house at six at night. Set my laptop till fucking yawn time if there's if it's been a yeah. busy day um and mate uh, uh, there's sometimes you don't sleep a lot i call them growth phases to be mm. honest mate like when you're not sleeping a lot and you're genuinely getting the hard work done you do grow um so i we have the energy and vitality to push through these kind of things at our age mate that's so why we're doing it at an age where we're like we're sweet man yeah you know i mean to, yeah. to continue doing it so it is interesting though because the way you look at it and the things that you're doing within property the major opportunities for large amount of wealth in a shorter space of time still mm. doing something like that in that feeling hats off to you mate because i was thinking about if i went back to be a waiter i remember i sat and broke down one of the times like a 10 hour shift mate i was actually counting for my bus fare and the extra two the two hours each side of commuting um i was getting paid like four pound 25 an hour man, and the actual account for it and it's like mate the fuck am Crazy. i doing man shite i when in reality it's just but that was probably one of the main components Probably been exposed to Naval quite a bit. Naval speaks so much about like never rent your time out for money. Mm -hmm. Always been value driven. Um and it wasn't until I started I've reading Almanac the Almanac just now, his, oh, his book. Yeah. Um and it wasn't until I started reading that that I realised holy shit, so much of like my program has been installed from like I've listened to that podcast with Joe Rogan and Naval fucked on so many times, mate. Yeah. I used to just sit and on replay. Yeah. Um, because his knowledge was just mental and I realised reading the book that a lot of my thought process was exposed to that mm. where YEN was a scalable business model that doesn't require like we've got a, we've got a structure now which won't have too much depth in it but mate being in a place where you could have the high performers group today I mean to have 18 individuals on it all smashing five figures you know or close to it plus per month um the power of having such a strict vetting process so when people get in everyone is so inspired and you're it's almost it's like a proud feeling it's like sticking people in a, a room together or when i mean when i used to host the networking events i would i would branch up the people that like bunch up the people that are like robbie's class blair's class andy's class mm. my mum's ill right i'm gonna split them all up and put them in people that aren't really like me right so that like the thought process was like trying to make it sustainable for everyone mm -hmm. when it just wasn't possible and i realize now when i look at the high performance group and i'm like mate you are all one fucking crushing it you are all two got the exact same values as me we're like-minded we all have the same drive to like move forward and inspire each other and it's like that is the solution not the try and make it sustainable for everyone and blah 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 it's like the vetting process is what enables me to do that and it's all those little things the little bumps in the road mate. yeah mate, i dropped fucking all the clients down to three clients in october last year yeah andrea ellis blair collie and isabel fucking always need to thank them because they're like they were the foundation of like right cool this actually works i can actually make it go go forward um and i was thinking earlier on when you were kind of speaking about the importance of building a scalable business model to where are now Having 18 individuals in a high performing group, moving forward, creating different structures that help them develop their business through exploring it together and through learning from each other and having the power of an open network, of different industry leading specialists. A lot of time goes into working on the business, working on a scalable business model processes, systems, delivering value, maintaining that as a whole. But in terms of the time they need to invest and the time I need to be there running it, that's an hour and 15 minutes a week, mate. That's class, mate. It's fucked. When you when you actually sit and like deep it and break it down, Aye. it's fucked. Um, because what we were taught or what we had grown up in, where money was scarce. Mm -hmm. And it's like the thing they do teach us is that it's it's not that easy. Aye. It's not that simple. 
Um, you've probably seen the quote from whatever fucking movie that's from, but it's like, once you know truly what you're doing and you've you've had all the experiences, you've had all the bumps and such advice, holy fucking shit. One, this is possible. And two, I can actually make, like, I can get to a level of wealth where I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I can fuck off the Bali or do, and the thing is, like, everything I do as well is completely remote, but yeah. I love the in-person shit too uh, much. Too. Like, even this, mate, it's like, I was on podcast full season one online, but for the, you know, it was like, you don't get the same buzz, the same feeling, though. Yeah. It's just different, bro. I've stopped, I've seen some class podcasts recently that have been released, but it's all like virtual still. Mm. And I actually just didn't listen to them because the quality, you know what I mean? It's, it, it's not the same. Yeah. You can vary, mate, without a doubt, man. Um, so what's in the horizon for you then over the next couple of years? We're speaking years rather than, um, months but what obviously property finishing uni mm -hmm. you want to go back to denmark produce that fucking mental light that i can't even looking up at the spot <laughs> it's, like, it's like pure it's mental in the thought process of it. so what, what do you feel like is the yeah on the horizon for you yeah mate i feel the next thing for me big one is going to be property um finish uni get that out the road you know um take what i can from the skills that i'll learn um, but really, really, really switch on in terms of big numbers now. Um, mm -hmm. Property is a different ball game. Want to um, get a good, solid foundation in that. Prove myself over the next year. Create a lot of fees. Create a lot of money from that. Use that cash pot to start my own portfolio. All these things. So really, really, really digging into that, that like property business side of things. Yeah, love that. Um, I want to basically create enough passive income through property so that I can just release cool products for the bagpipes i enjoy doing that mm -hmm. um i want to like there's there's so much to do in the bagpipe industry i want to revolutionize the instrument so this is us coming on to flux I want to completely revolutionize it so that basically there's so many external factors that limit the performance capabilities of the bagpipes and i want to completely not redesign the bagpipes but enhance them with all these cool inventions yeah. that no one's done before and i enjoy like I want time to sit behind my laptop for hours and hours and hours and make all these wee funny models and make yeah. sure do the tests and make sure it works and prototype it and stuff. I want to buy myself the time back so that I can do that. And mm -hmm. um, besides obviously having a lot of money and getting a nice car and things, mate, yeah. it's, it's, it's a weird one. You know, mate, it's actually, it's funny because my car's absolutely fucked now. Mm -hmm. So my exhaust is falling off. It's like my windows didn't work and it's, it's all just, it's fun to bits, mate, right? Um, and I remember, like, the other day when I was going to view that property and speak to that vendor and all this, and I was like, this looks like it's going to go through and I'm, I'm going to make 10 grand in fees for this. And I'm like, fuck, I could, could get myself a new car and, like, my car's fun to bits and backfire and I'm, like, stalling all this because my clutch is fucked and all this. And I'm like, Ken Rab, you're making, like, you're making, you're making decent money and you're still driving this. Like, why not buy a... Why not buy a decent car? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Ken, what? I've not really thought about it yet. <laughs> so I was like, my next thing's maybe get a nice car, man. I might get a cool car for a change. Well, fun, yeah. But uh, I feel that's like, that's a big milestone for me. I do like cars. Mm. I like my cars, I like my assets, all these things. Start buying myself some nice things, I think, over the next few years um, and really get to the scale where I feel powerful. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like people coming to me and asking stuff. I like people want to do business with me. Yeah. And right now, Especially getting, I've done business before in my industry and that's fine, I've cracked that. People know who I am, but in property, different ball game. Yep. I'm a small fish, I'm, I'm a beginner. And I want people to see that I'm, I'm not like anyone else in the industry. To be honest, I just want to make everyone a bit of money. We've all mm -hmm. got a bit of dough in our pocket and we can all buy the missus a nice watch or whatever, you know. Yep. And, and and that's a winner. Um, so building that kind of genuine image behind business for me and property over the next few years is going to be really important um, in order to get that sense of power. And folk could be like, fuck that's Robbie McIsaac mm. like he's driving a minted car as well but he's actually built this massive thing mm. for scratch yeah so it's to me like I can't wait to see you achieve all of these things mate it's going to be fucking outstanding it's going to be brilliant um in terms of people being able to witness this journey what kind of platforms are you predominantly on totally um, man personal probably you know I don't actually I'm not really pushing that I'm a personal brand right mm. now I'm just posting some cool stuff that I like. So follow me on Instagram, just yeah. um at Robbie McIsaac. Yeah. Um I'm sure it'll probably be in the in the yeah, comments or something. Yeah. 
obviously I've got your Facebook and your LinkedIn. I'm a bit more, a bit more corporate on the LinkedIn just now. But um, yeah, Matt, just Instagram is probably the coolest. You'll get a real sense of like my personality <laughs> on that and, and things, you know. Don't really give a fuck in that sense. So yeah, man, um, Instagram's a big one. Love that, man. And in regards to SXR, there'll be a lot of potential young entrepreneurs obviously listening to this with the, obviously the name of the podcast and stuff like that. But would be anyone that's wanting to start out in business or they've maybe started already, how do they get in touch with you with something like SXR? Yeah, totally. So we don't have a page. Um, we don't really push it that much like that. It's just um, word of mouth. We get a lot of connections through that. So SXR, it's our um, kind of young entrepreneur consultancy as such. It's yeah. a, more of a support group for young guys who want to make a bit of dough. Um, so just reach out to myself or Suha Amin, who's my business partner, and he's really, really cool, really successful in the agency-based business kind of side of things. So just give us, um, you'll see it again if you just follow me on Instagram, and um, you'll see me tagging him and stuff. We have a bit of banter on that, so <laughs> totally just get in touch. Listen, we're, we're here to help. We're not putting brands on things or names. Just reach out to us, and if there's anything we can do to help, whether that's bagpiping, business, property, anything, uh, I'd love to have a chat and, and see if we can do business together. So that's me, John. Love that, Robbie, mate. Thank you so much for coming on, mate. It's been fucking Thank class. Thanks, man. We're moving these mics here. I know. There we go, man. It, mate. Well, it's been fucking dynamite. So much value, so much covered. You're going to take a lot away for this, mate. We'll obviously Likewise. be doing a part two in the future when aye, some exciting drops. Yeah, so... no, nah, there's big news coming, definitely. But um, no, nah, John, it's been class, mate. I'm love absolutely that. buzzing. Cheers, man. Below. Um, aye, we're sweet, man. If you're listening on YouTube... Make sure you subscribe if you're listening on Spotify. Make sure you ring the wee bell. Um, follow if you haven't already. And make sure you hit us up on Instagram man, and let us know the main takeaways, the main golden nuggets. Um, tag us in the stories. Tag Robbie as well. And yeah, man, thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Paul, as always, mate.